Okay, so before we get started again, uh, I had a few questions online about ground-mounted arrays. So I'll address ground-mounted arrays briefly. Um, there are roof-mounted arrays, which we talked about, and there are ground-mounted arrays. Ground-mounted arrays work if you, like at our house, have complex roof structure and shading that just makes roof-mounted solar an impossibility. I would argue that if you have the ability to do roof-mounted sol solar, it will be cheaper. Um, but if you want to do ground-mounted array, the ideal situation for any home that has land and has a field is to have trees around a house that are deciduous so that the house is cooled in the summer by the trees and in the winter, the leaves fall off in the fall so you get passive uh, solar heating in the winter and then at all times, some distance from the house, there's a ground-mounted array that um, helps produce electricity. That's an ideal situation. However, it's not one that most people have, right? Most people live in neighborhoods. My mother's house in Charlotte's a classic example. But if you have land or if you have the impossibilities like we do in Waynesville, then a ground-mounted array may be a solution. Um, a ground-mounted array costs a little more. I was giving some data. I had a solar installer give me data uh, for, he was, they quoted me $2.40 a watt to install it on the roof and $2.80 per watt to install it in the ground, which I thought was a fair price. And that would have to go about 200 feet from our house and you have to run the line and then you have to put in schedule 40 pipe and, and then there's, and everything's become much more plug and play. It's about spending less time on the roof in the industry because time is money and less time on the job site. So. Uh, today, what typically might be used instead of doing big concrete bores is actually just putting screws in the ground that go down a good bit. And then you put up the Schedule 40 pipe, you run it across, and then you have the solar modules attached to it, and then you run the line back to the house. Okay, so that's ground-mounted solar in a nutshell, a real quick nutshell. It is a little more costly, but it can be an option for folks um, if they have the land and, or the, the roof obstructions like I mentioned. Um, let's see. Anything else about that? Oh, so a, a ground-mounted array at our latitude in the northern hemisphere, the ideal sighting of ground-mounted array is 35 degree tilt due south. That's how you get your best production. And the great thing about ground-mounted solar is that you're not limited by the direction of the roof or anything else, right? Fixed real estate on a house, unless you're building a house and you're building a house and you're taking into account the roof angle and everything else for solar, then you're just, just kind of stuck with what you have. So ground-mounted array uh, can work for people. Okay, so we're going to step into policy now for the next 45 minutes. And policy, this is, this is the dark part of the, of, the, of the Empire Strikes Back, okay? So let's get into it because remember, solar, it's not about technological, it's not about technology, it's about policy. Okay, solar policy in Western North Carolina. Forgive me, I am going to read some of this. You're not supposed to do that, but uh, some of the information I've been thoughtful about and I want to read a little bit of it. So, there are four utilities in our immediate area. There's Duke Energy, Duke Progress, Duke Energy Progress, Haywood EMC, and Town of Waynesville in our immediate area, okay? And um, each of those utilities is a monopoly, right? You don't have a choice about who you have. In healthcare, you have eh, a few choices, right? You can go to Duke Life Point, you can go to Pardee, you can go to Mission, you can go to Park Ridge, you can even go further and go to some atrium facility if you want. You have a few options when it comes to healthcare. You have no option when you have in it, when you have um, electricity, right? Your provider is your provider. Even though there's four in the area, you have one, and that's the only one you're going to have. Duke Energy is a regulated monopoly. It's an investor-owned Fortune 150 company valued yesterday at $82.63 billion and has 8.2 million customers in North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky. It's a monster. It's an 800-pound grill in the room, okay? It's very big. And it, uh, for, for purposes of our discussion today, yes, there is Duke Energy and Duke Energy Progress. That's from an old uh, combining merger a long time ago. For, going forward, we'll probably just call it Duke Energy, okay, because it's, it's one company. Then we have Haywood EMC, 
which stands for Electric Membership Cooperative Corporation. And it is a Touchstone Energy Cooperative member and serves customers, I didn't know this, but it's just quite a, quite, quite a large area, in Haywood County, Buncombe County, Transylvania, Jackson, Madison, Macon counties, as well as Oconee in South Carolina and Rabin County in Georgia. So it's quite a large territory. There are many EMCs throughout the state. In fact, the, if you look at a map of North Carolina, most of it has, it has a lot of rural areas. North Carolina is a fairly rural state, notwithstanding the, the increasing size of uh, cities. <clears throat> so, Haywood MC serves rural areas exclusively, and it has, as I've been told, eight customers per linear mile of transmission line. Duke Energy has 34. Why would Duke Energy ever want to take over that other area? It's more maintenance. Duke's got it made. Okay, and then we have wonderful Waynesville. <laughs> so town of Waynesville, T-O-W, has a municipality-owned utility, which it's part of the electricities. So there's like eh, 80 or so electricities in North Carolina, and these are municipality-owned utilities. And they have an electricities sort of, um, you know, larger group, and they're meeting, I think, in a week or two or two weeks in um, at Harris Casino, and I, I'm not invited. So I'd like to go and be a fly on the wall. It'd be fun. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a municipality-owned utility, and what essentially happens in Waynesville is that it buys energy wholesale and then resells it to account holders. It's very simple. So when a contract comes up, and I think the next contract is like 2026, it's like a 10-year contract to buy energy wholesale. And this particular round, we are buying energy from Santee Cooper, in South Carolina, because Duke's rate was too high. But then you start getting into the 2022, 2023, and you start thinking probably as the town, oh, geez, we've got to renegotiate that rate again. What's it going to be? And there's always fear that there's going to be an escalator in cost. Uh, it so happened at the time of, the, of this current contract that when it started, Santee Cooper was putting online a nuclear power plant. And they were looking for customers. And they're willing to offer, I guess, a little more of a sweetheart deal because they were trying to get customers immediately to meet that generation. And so that was maybe a good thing for Waynesville. Waynesville, Waynesville buys electricity at 3.7 cents per kilowatt hour. And then it charges you, I guess more recently, 11.233 cents per kilowatt hour if you're a resident. If you're a business or if you have three phase, it's a little different. So here's what happens. Town of Waynesville buys electricity, sells it to you, minus its operating cost, it will make $1.3 million a year. It's not a question. It will make $1.3 million a year because it's in its budget. Every year going forward, it's going to make 1.3. How would it guarantee that it's going to make 1.3 million? It raises your rate to account for it, if, if needs be. And that $1.3 million from the electric fund basically is pushed over into the general fund. And then, you know, things happen in town. Like people get raises, people get hired. It, it perhaps helps to offset your ad valorem taxes, property taxes, et cetera. And so that's what the town has. But there are some trappings in that that we're going to talk about. They're trappings from all of these different uh, entities. OK, so let's take a time out. So why should you care about solar and distributed energy at all? That is, energy that you own that you send to someone else, like town of Waynesville or Haywood EMC. Who really cares about solar? I mean, you can do energy efficiency in your home. You can have EVs. Why do solar? Some people would say, well, it's because I want return on investment. I want in eight to 10 years to be able to own my own source of energy. And in doing so, I know that after that time, I basically, with operations and maintenance, getting a new inverter after 10 or 15 years, but basically, I'm going to create free energy going forward at my home. So for some people, it's completely monetary. For a lot of people, it's about climate change, right? It's about renewable energies, solar, wind, geothermal. Geothermal is an option in this area. Um, not going to get into it today. Wind, as we mentioned, not so much an option. You know, I've even queried, could I put a 3KW, you know, 150-foot-tall wind turbine in my backyard? I went through all the iterations and calculations, and I thought, well, Kay wouldn't like it, my wife, first of all. Um, and it just wouldn't work. So solar is really the only option around here. So why should we care about solar? Well, I'll tell you why. 
How will renewables figure into the energy mix going forward? This is Duke Energy's mix in 2019. Check it out, 52% nuclear, 27% gas, 12% coal, 6% renewables. Look what Duke plans to do in 14 years from 2019. 8% renewables. That's it. That's all it plans to do. And it's going to reduce nuclear a little bit. It's going to increase natural gas. And it's going to reduce coal by 50% from 2019 levels. It re Duke recently got a report card, and the report card was an F. And what its plan is going forward, we're supposed to be a 70% reduction of emissions by 2005 levels in a few years, and, and their, the plan put forward does not pass muster. Now, I'm going to get into the politics of it all, but really some people do this because of climate warming climate change and the ability to create clean energy at home um, is an important thing to a lot of people. It's very important to me. And so when I look at what Duke's doing, you know, I just recently went to a, an international utility conference and let's, guess how many times they talked about distributed energy? Zero. Didn't, didn't hear it in conversations over coffee. Didn't hear it uh, in any of the breakout sessions. I didn't hear it in, in the plenary sessions. I did hear it from one person. And that person was the vice president of Con Edison in San Diego. And he looked like Gavin Newsom. His hair slicked back and everything. This guy was super sharp. But the reason that that particular utility is doing really cool things is because the people in that area demand it. They drive Teslas. They have solar. You know, in San Diego, it's sunny all the time. They have solar on the roofs. They've experienced wildfires. They understand things. There's a different political environment. There's a different culture. And so the utility has to respond to that. And because of that, I'm not saying it's because they just were good natured, but they have responded to it. And they were much more progressive in terms of policy than any uh, others that I heard at the conference. So that may be why that matters. All right, this is my emoji face whenever I discuss utilities. It, it sums me up pretty well. So here's some things that I've... So, why are utilities worried about losing income to, from solar customers? Well, let me just read through these to start with. These are things I've heard recently. Solar hurts poor people because only the rich can afford solar. So when you subtract those solar customers from your income stream, it means the poor will have to pay more to support the grid. That's a Duke Energy talking point. They take it to the North Carolina Utilities Commission, and they will beat that thing all day long. And you know why? Because they're a Fortune 150 company, and I'm sure it's focus group tested. It sounds right, right? It makes sense. So it sounds like that's true, but why might that not be true? Well, here's the thing. Why, here's the reason why. Take, for instance, in the town of Waynesville. Waynesville buys electricity from Santee Cooper for 3.7 cents per kilowatt hour. But during peak demand on the spot market, because electric usage consumption is not the same all the time. Sometimes it peaks, and it gets up to a level where if you really want energy, you're really going to pay for it. So 200 hours a year in Waynesville, in areas of peak demand, Waynesville pays $18 per kilowatt hour. And I did the math last night, and it's something like between 450 and 500 times more than the normal rate that it pays. So when does peak demand happen? Peak demand happens in the middle of the day, in the early afternoon. That's when, the, the, that's when the grid feels the most strain and the, the production, the capacity of electricity feels the most strain. And that's why these prices go up. Well, interestingly, if you have solar, when's solar doing its best job? Middle of the day. It's humming along. Middle of the day. So to the extent that a town or a county or someplace else had more solar, you might be able to offset that $18 and therefore, your overall rates might be lower for every customer, not just, you know, the folks that have solar. So that's holes in that argument. These are things I've heard, not, not from people off the street, not from any particular cable news network. These are things I've heard from people who are in positions of, of power and within the industry. Okay, second thing. People who have solar installed don't expect a good return on their investment. They just want to be green. Remember that? Yeah? Okay. They want to be green. I've heard that. They just want to be, really, no one expects a return on investment. You, you just buy a stock one day and you just go, oh, whatever happens, happens, you know. Or maybe I get nothing. No, people do expect a return. It's called an internal rate of return. If you spend $25,000, $35,000 on a system, what you would like to know is that you have a 10-year contractual obligation from your utility that in 8 to 10 years, 
you have essentially, through your savings, paid off the cost of that system. Because there is, in economics, an opportunity cost of investing that twenty-five, thirty, dollars or $35,000. You could have put it in a Roth IRA. You could have put it in some other instrument in order to realize a return. We won't allow a house to be net zero. I've heard that. I find that's crazy. It made me red because there are communities in Western North Carolina that are entirely net zero. So it's, that notion to me is preposterous. There are communities in Western North Carolina, you know, of course they're advertising to people that can afford you know, at least $750,000 homes, but they're thinking forward and there are communities that are actually net negative. That is the communities are producing more energy than they use and are sending it out to the grid for free. That seems like a pretty cool thing. Solar will fry the transformers. No, it won't. Actually, my mother's house overproduces a lot. She overproduced last year, thanks to wearing an LED light on her forehead and not turning on the rest of the lights. She <laughs> overproduced 5,000 kilowatt hours in 2021. 5,000 kilowatt hours. And I will have you know that the sky did not become as black as sackcloth and a fiery squall did not descend upon Heritage Hills Drive in Charlotte because of that. The transformers just kept doing their job. So that is, is not true. There, there is, there, there is a, physical, a physical limit, right, to any device. That's true. But the idea of overproduction, here's what happens. When you produce solar in real time and it's more than what your home uses, it's a current, right? It's like water. Where does it go? It goes next door. It doesn't go five miles away to Lowe's. It just goes next door because your neighbor's using it. So it's the path of least resistance and is used in real time. Uh, electricity is, is consumed instantane nearly instantaneously. Okay, next thing. Renewables are unreliable. The sun doesn't shine at night and the wind doesn't blow all the time. Thanks, Captain Obvious. <laughs> you know, you've heard this all the time. You've got, everyone in here has heard that. Everyone here has heard that. And here's the thing about that. Where there's grains of truth in what you're saying, right? If this is 40 years ago, I'm like, yeah, you're right. You're right, you know. Hmm. Because renewables are not going to be able to capture all of that. In fact, today, last night I was on Haywood EMC's website, and there's a nice video you can watch about going solar. And it talks about how, you know, when solar's not reliable, we have coal. And coal can meet all your needs all the time. I mean, it sounds like it's from a, like a coal industry, but it's probably an old video. But I was just looking at it. Here's the thing about renewables. There, uh, there has recently, recently been commissioned outside of Portland, Oregon, a utility that uses wind and solar and battery storage, and that's it. And it's powering 500,000 homes, and it's doing it without a problem. Okay? And there are battery technologies that are being worked on that are incredible. Folks will say things like, well, there's all these rare minerals, and there's kids in the Congo, and they're mining this you know, cobalt, and there's all these other supply constraints. And that's true, there are. But don't think about a battery like it's a Duracell, and don't think about it like it's a Tesla Powerwall. There are different types of, if you're thinking about it like that, you're thinking too small. All a battery is, is an ability to store energy. So think about this. What do we have a lot of here? A lot of water. Got a lot of water. Got a lot of water in South Carolina, a lot of water in Georgia, a lot of water in North Carolina. Comes from the mountains, rains all the time. Lots of water. Lots of lakes, lots of reservoirs. So here's an idea. You have solar, and solar works to pump water uphill. And then it sits in a reservoir, and at night when the solar doesn't work, the turbine kicks on and the water flows downhill and creates energy. That lake, that reservoir then becomes a battery storage system, and it's done. In fact, you could even put the solar panels on top of the reservoir in a floating ballast and have it all work like that. There's places all over the world where that happens. So the idea of just a Duracell battery or a Tesla Powerwall is way too small thinking. Two other technologies are being worked on. One's in Sardinia, and it's being worked with a major Italian um, um, major utility in, 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 in Italy, and they're working on a CO2 battery. So what it is, is it's a huge dome and you have gas in it. And then you power in the daytime, solar or wind, powers the gas back through and compresses it and puts it in tanks. And then at night, it releases it and expands. And when it expands, it runs a turbine and creates energy. So that's another opportunity. There's also an opportunity to heat sand. Huge cylinders and you can take, the, again, the solar and the wind, the renewables, and you can heat sand to like 1500 degrees and then at night, you use the heat energy to, again, power the turbine to create electricity. So there's all different types of battery technologies. And that's why when I said what I was thankful for, I'm thankful for the really smart people. You know, I don't care if they want to be billionaires. 
I don't care if Superman saves the world and wants a billion dollar check at the end of the day. I'm just glad it, you know, something's getting done. So, and last thing, the world is actually flat. I saw it on Facebook. <laughs> That's not true. I made that up. But it kind of, to me, it fits in with all this other stuff. Okay. I apologize for the graininess of this photo. I was at the conference in Charlotte, and I had to get down on the floor. This is a Haywood, this is not Haywood EMC, but an EMC um, presentation. And I took a picture of this. So here's what's happened with the energy grid writ large in the United States of America. In the last 50 years, energy demand has been flat. You might not think that because you're like, well, what about all the Walmarts and the Targets and all these neighborhoods? I mean, you think energy is, is really that we're producing a lot more, but it's not true because of all the efficiencies now that are built into modern buildings. They're just so much more efficient. The businesses are chasing those efficiencies whenever they can, and the net result is that energy demand for 50 years has been stagnant. And so that's just kind of left the utilities going, well, we got the same lines, we, we pay people more because there's, there's always an inflation escalator for wages and things cost more. And that's how you get these little price increases. But energy demand for the last 50 years has been flat. How can solar help going forward? Well, this graph here, if you can see, the green part. Okay, so that's terawatts of efficiency demand. It's just actual, you know, load. Here we have... If you look at anything under the green curve there, that looks kind of flat too. It would be saying, well, going to, into the future, we're still going to be kind of flat. But the green part represents electric vehicles. The electrification of the transportation sector. 27% of emissions in this country are due to uh, fossil fuels emitted from vehicles. So if you can electrify everything that has wheels, including boats and airplanes, but maybe that's down the road, then what you have here is a huge increase in energy demand. Well, who's going to meet that demand? Are you going to put in another gas plant? You know, are we going to put in another nuclear plant or micronuclear plants? This represents a real opportunity for solar to have a symbiotic relationship with the increased demands on the grid, right? It's good for customers, and it's good for the grid in general. So a 32% growth from 2015 to, 2000, uh, 2015 to 2050. Okay, growth opportunities. So at the conference, in the plenary session, a very smart man from the Department of Energy gets up there and talks for a good while, and he says to us, EV, or electric vehicle, saturation in the United States is currently 2%. In 18 months from now, it will be 10%. The 10% number is low. I mean, it's not, it doesn't represent a lot. What is interesting is that is a five-fold increase in 18 months. Um, for those of you who have looked at electric vehicles, and that's what the next segment is on, it's going to be very exciting. It's sort of the return of the Jedi celebration, if you will. Um, uh, their reservations are crazy. There are reservations on the Ford F-150 Lightning, on the Tesla Cybertruck. We've had a Tesla on order for almost a year, and they keep messing around with the delivery date. And they're like, you're going to get it now. You're not. It's going to be six weeks later. And so sometime in October, we'll take delivery of our Tesla. It will have been a year. And that's bananas. So there is serious demand for electric vehicles. And it's a really exciting time because a lot of these companies are American. They're startup companies. Um, not all of them will succeed. There will be market shakeout. There will be mergers. That's what happens in any market. But the game changer probably is the Ford F-150. The best-selling truck in America is going all electric. And they're not playing around. I spoke with an exec from Ford. And he it was a Ford, Toyota, Kia, and GM, and they're sitting in this standing room only uh, panel discussion. And he said, if you don't think it's going to happen, just don't talk to those people. It's not worth it. The ship has sailed. It has sailed. It's left the old world, and we're ready to step foot in this. They bet $6 billion on a new plant that's going to go in and straddle Tennessee and Kentucky. They're not messing around. The fact that you could go to a board meeting and convince someone that this is the future of your company, and for them to say, you're right, let's do it. And then to put all the money into it, the ship has sailed. GM has bet big, 35% of their cars by 2030 will be electric. And they're actually a laggard. GM is a laggard. So anyways, not without discussing EVs too much, which is my favorite topic, this, tra this transition 
really represents an opportunity. And it's a way to think about energy in the home environment that's much different. I'm not talking th smart thermostats and asking Siri and Alexa to do everything for you. I'm talking about an, energy, an integrated microgrid within the house, right? You have solar panels, you have a car, driving on sunshine. That's a modern miracle. You pull up, you plug in, and then you drive away and you're driving on sunshine. It's really cool. Okay, so here's an example of fleets because fleets are coming too. Part of the reason that people can't get some of these EVs is because fleets are gobbling them up. Because if there's anything that the FedExes and UPSs and Amazons of the world care about, it's how many dollars they're spending per mile getting from place to place. So they have partnerships. Uh, Walmart just rescued a startup called Canoe and they're gonna buy 10,000 vehicles. Walmart has some pretty interesting, um, it might not be the world's best employer, but it has some pretty interesting environmental social governance goals. All right, let's talk for a minute. Okay, so switch gears and talk about solar rate structures and tariffs. Um, Duke Energy and Duke Energy Progress. Um, so we have Duke and Duke Progress. And what happened is we have, whenever we got commissioned, we basically signed a 10-year contract with Duke for net metering. And net metering means that, you know, I send a kilowatt out, I get a kilowatt back, and it's all netted at the end of the month. It's elegant. It's very simple to understand. A fourth grader can understand it with fourth grade math, and I appreciate that, because who wants to look at a complex rate structure to determine your energy bill? So as I mentioned before, if your solar rate produces 1,500 kilowatt hours, but you consume 1,200, you subtract that 1,300 kilowatt hour surplus in this case, and this might be in the summer, and what would happen with Duke is that you would take the 300 and you would bank it to the next month. And then if you produce an excess in, say, July, you would bank it to the next month. And why do you do that? Because in the winter, the sun doesn't shine as much, Captain Obvious. So you're going to draw from that bank, that energy reserve, to get through the winter. And then on May 31st, with Duke at least, you have a cutoff. And any excess surplus you've accrued, like my mother's 5,000 kilowatt hours, they wipe the slate clean and you start over. And that's fine. I'm okay with that. <clears throat> All right, so this, is, this looks like some kind of like crazy political um, uh, commercial or something, but Duke Energy seeks to destroy net metering. So currently before the North Carolina Utilities Commission is docket number E, and you might want to write this down, E100 sub 180, a request for change of the current solar tariff to time of use crediting, which would penalize customers and extend the return on investment well beyond the eight to 10 years that net metering customers currently have. So Duke, here's what happened. And this is really a fun story. So Duke had these incentives um, where you guys know what happens, right? Duke is a regulated monopoly which means it's not a monopoly outright. It can't just do whatever it wants to do. It has to submit a request, whatever it is, to the North Carolina Utilities Commission, and then that go, that's publicized, and it has a docket number, and then the public gets to respond. If you're an individual, it's great, you've written in, but a lot of times this action happens through um, special interest groups, right, in the best sense of the word, citizen, you know, in some citizen groups from Raleigh, et cetera, and they'll go to the North Carolina Utilities Commission and they'll have their policy people, their wonks, and their lawyers, and they'll look over the language of what Duke wants to do, and ultimately what happens at the end of the day a lot of times is they meet somewhere in the middle. Well, one of the things that happened that came out of a previous rate structure was that Duke agreed to allow for 20 megawatts of capacity for renewable energy. And in order to accelerate that, what Duke would do is provide a rebate. It would provide a rebate in three categories, residential, commercial, and nonprofit. And this started up a few years ago. And increasingly, you know, it, the, the window would open on January 1 at midnight. And increasingly, you know, the public found out about it, the solar installers knew about solar companies because they're able to pass along those savings to customers. So the, the rates changed a little bit, but we got one of the rebates, and it was 40 cents per watt installed in Charlotte. So to give you an idea, we paid $2 a watt installed with Tesla, so that was 20% that we got a rebate check from. And that was really great in addition to the tax credit. Um, but what happened was, and we'll go back to, say, January 1, 2021. Right? This, 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 they, they, would, they would open up the window. They would put people on a wait list. They'd open up the window on January 1. Well, here's what happened on January 1, 2021. 
Some people were sitting at a computer ready to file that request for a rebate because at the time it was first come, first serve. If you were at a party on New Year's Eve and you were clanking a champagne glass, a flute with champagne in it, and you tipped it back and you drank it, you missed out because by the time you finished your, your, your glass of champagne, the entire capacity for the year was gone. That was the demand for residential solar. And you don't think Duke saw that? Of course they saw that. And they're like, oh my God, this is nuts. We didn't realize so many people would want residential solar. So here's the challenge. Solar's been around for over you know, 50 years. The price has come down a lot. We've had more installations in the last 15, 20 years than we did before that, obviously, as it ramps up. 1% of the country has residential solar. That's at 1%. And most of it's not here in North Carolina, you know, even though we have pretty good solar adoption rate, a lot of it's on the utility side. So they're scared of it. They're scared of the hockey, of the hockey stick phenomena where people are going to want it and the, the proof is in the pudding, right, or in the champagne glass because you missed out if you were drinking champagne at a party. You, you didn't get the rebate. So Duke is now working to try to say things like we're going to have a time of use tariff and in the afternoon you're going to have to pay, uh, that's when you're going to get your best solar rate except in the late afternoon your production isn't the greatest because it's the end of the day. There's a lot of things baked into it. And they say things like well we're going to help some poor communities maybe but we're not going to be contractually obligated to help those communities. So there's just a lot of nasty stuff and ultimately the take home message, like here's the thing, I understand that Duke is responsible. I don't hate Duke. I don't hate Exxon. At the end of the day what they're responsible to are their shareholders. That's how corporations work, right? If you're the CEO, your time limit might be five years. And in those five years, you're responsible for creating a dividend, increasing the stock price, the value of the company, maybe your market share, and then you get a golden parachute, you get $100 million or more in stock options, and you go off to Florida or something. And then somebody else jumps in. What I discovered at the electrification conference was, you know, I used to think it was just a bunch of old white men, and they just didn't get it. But I was surrounded by a, young, a lot of young white men that wanted to be old white men, which let me know that it's not, it's not an age thing, right? It's not a sort of getting lost in the transition. It's a culture, right? And the culture of a monopoly is that it wants to maintain its monopoly status at all points. Now, interestingly, the programs that we have, many of them are so much better with Duke and Duke Progress than they are with Haywood EMC and the town of Waynesville. And the reason that might be the case is because, again, they have to, go not to, have to go to loggerheads at the North Carolina Utilities Commission and concessions are, are, are given. That doesn't happen locally. You don't have a regulated monopoly at Haywood EMC or in town of Waynesville. You have a monopoly. Okay? And the gentleman from Haywood, or rather from the EMCs in Charlotte, when I was talking to him, he was talking about the great things about EMCs, that the people come from their communities and it's, it's owned by the membership. And every person in every district has its elected representative that sits on the board and they drive policy. That might be true in a perfect world. But what do we know about most people that sits on boards in certain rural areas? Sometimes they're just the wealthiest landowner, right? They might be the most popular person at church. So what I'm saying is whatever their position is, it doesn't mean that they're energy experts or especially care about it. So when you thrust people in a rural community into this role and you look at what's happening with electrification of our grid and the electrification of everything, then I'm afraid that they're not, well, they're not well prepared. And when I spoke with the vice president of the EMCs, he said, I know the challenge is we have to push down through our organizations, through our membership, to our customers, and that is a huge challenge. It doesn't matter what we know in Raleigh or Charlotte if we can't get local folks to do it. So education, I think, then, is the key. Same thing with town of Waynesville. Um, town of Waynesville has four aldermen and a mayor. The utility for the town of Waynesville is a scarecrow. It's a stick man out in the field. It is not sentient, okay? Everything that happens with the utility in town goes through the governing board. And the governing board has to worry about roundabouts and sewer systems and infill development and affordable housing and... COVID, and they have a lot of things. So give them the benefit of the doubt. They're, and, they're, and on top of all that, it's a part-time job that's not well remunerated, right? They have their own jobs. They have to go sit in a meeting where people yell at them for four hours before they ever get to discuss real business. So it's a challenge. But one of the challenges here, unfortunately, is having a utility that doesn't really do anything. Town of Waynesville offers no incentives, none. 
If you're a church, if you're Grace or you're First United Methodist, if you're in Duke territory, you can get a 75 cent per watt rebate on an installed solar system, PVRA. Um, that doesn't happen in the town of Waynesville. It might even be hard to get permission to do it in some cases, right? There, there are a lot of challenges at a local level, and there's a lot of working through it that needs to happen. Okay. All right, so solar schedules, I, you know, I'm not, we have four utilities. I'm not going to get into sort of like doing the whole math like it's a long, drawn-out calculus problem for each particular, but I'm going to talk about some points just from, uh, briefly. Solar schedules across these utilities, the devil's in the details. And to understand policy is to understand the monopoly status of the utilities, right? It's not to go out there with a pitchfork and, and threaten people. It's just to say, understand what their charge is, right? If you're a Fortune 150 company, you're responsible to your shareholders. People want dividends or heads roll. And the thing about the way our system is set up in the U.S. is that there was this sort of agreement. We'll let you have a monopoly, but you have to do this. One thing, it's going to be regulated. The two things you must do is you must not allow blackouts. Reliable energy is a must. The second thing is it needs to be affordable. And unfortunately, what these utilities do, Haywood EMC maybe in particular, because I remember that quote, is that we provide reliable and affordable energy. If you go to any of the websites, it's about reliability and affordability. You can also see somebody going like this and putting on their hat and just walking out the door. Because it's not really about engaging the public with distributed energy. It's not about EVs. It's not about what's coming. The folks at the conference, they know what's coming. They're thinking about it. And every single breakout session I went to, they're talking EVs and what to do because they understand that it's coming fast and they need to work on it. And they're also understanding that it's a potential income sweetener because for 50 years, they have not produced any more energy. They've just raised prices. The thing about EVs is that when you produce, like I was saying earlier, with more solar, more wind, more solar, more wind, and you have the EVs too, that profit helps to build out more of that. And then eventually what you see is a, is a curve where the price of energy goes down. And that's a more democratic world. It's also good for the U.S., because it makes us more competitive. I hope, I hope to God, we don't, I don't think we, I hope we do not fight a world war in the 21st century. It would be annihilation, right? Everybody has nuclear weapons, notwithstanding what's happened in Russia and Ukraine um, and our proxy support of Ukraine. But here's the thing. The sort of battles of the 21st century are economic ones, right? And those pit different geopolitical interests against each other in different forms of government and different values, right? So is it authoritarian? Because if you can electrify an authoritarian economy, it's going to be pretty slick and pretty cheap to produce things and get them out. And the United States is projected in some, by some measures to be laggards because we have fossil fuels, right? And if we can get off fossil fuels, that's better, right? Because eight of the top ten fuel uh, petroleum producers in the world are not democracies. They're authoritarian regimes. And what do you need if you're an authoritarian regime? Do you need consent of the governed? No, you just need an AK-47. You stand over a hole in the ground because the hole in the ground is where the stuff is that you need that you can sell in the world market. So it doesn't matter what the population does and who wants to, I mean, look, Biden is visiting Saudi Arabia right now. You know, that's, you know, not to talk politics, but that's a tough one, right? You're visiting with a crown prince who had a journalist cut up with a bone saw and you're there because you need, in part because you need them to release more oil into the world market because winter is coming in Europe. And there's geopolitics involved. Okay, so net metering currently, to wrap up, net metering currently exists with Duke. If you install a system by the end of the year currently, you still can lock in for net metering. Importantly also, there's a tax credit, investment tax credit associated with solar right now. Uh, it had been 30%. 30 it was 26% last year, 26% again this year. Next year, it goes to 22%, and then the following year, it sunsets entirely. Now, Congress has a way of sometimes jolting itself awake and doing things, so it could restore the tax credits, but I wouldn't count on it, you know? So basically, the, talk, the clock is ticking for uh, tax credits because that helps to you know, cr reduce uh, your investment cost. Um, so that's interesting with Duke and Duke Progress. Haywood EMC, here's what I calculated. I had a meeting with them, and I was thinking to myself, okay, well, what if I did a ground-mounted array, and I considered myself like somebody with like 20 acres out here and had cows somewhere in a rural county, and I want to put in a ground-mounted array. What I discovered, just doing the numbers, is that if I bought the system myself online wholesale, installed it myself with blood and sweat, uh, with, with sweat equity, and then I had an electrician come and tie it in, 
I calculated it would take me 39 years to get my return on investment. Which is basically means you're just, you know, you're not ever going to, you know, it's, you would do it because you want to do it because it's the right thing, but that's it. So policy should change so that it's like, you know, reasonable, eight to 10 years, not something that's prohibitive. And then with town of Waynesville, interestingly, I guess this is like uh, six months now going on, trying to consider the town of Waynesville, re reconsider the solar tariff in Waynesville. Um, you know, it's a challenge. It's ongoing and it's a challenge. And I'm involved in those discussions, and it's a challenge. The, the, what the town wants to do, for those who live in Waynesville, is it very much wants to safeguard the $1.3 million a year. And it looks at the solar customer as taking away from that. And that's unfortunate, because if you've been down to frog level just a little ways up, there's 14 new townhomes going in. Isn't that additional capacity? What about frog level being built out better? Isn't that additional capacity? So, you know... And then, of course, the, the, the sort of notion that if you provide it to, the only rich people are going to put in solar, so the poor are going to be left on the hook. Um, interesting perspective, considering that people's accounts are being cut off in Waynesville, and they just have to pay up, but that's a different discussion. So lots of challenges here. There are ways to incorporate it through the entire you know, in, income spectrum. There, 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 we, we don't have a town grant writer, for instance that we maybe could really use. There's a lot of money. There's COVID money. There's infrastructure money that's coming down the pike. There's Volkswagen money, right, from the slap on the hand diesel gate. There's money for different things. And I'm not suggesting that, that those things maybe aren't being pursued. But there are programs out there. For instance, there's a USDA program where Waynesville could get, the utility in Waynesville could get a 0% interest loan for 20 years and then relend that money to the town, to businesses, to residents, to, to do solar or to do EV charging, et cetera, at a very low interest rate. So it's those kinds of opportunities that I think the town should explore more of. Because either you sit here and you say, there's just too much on my, on my plate, you know, and papers have fallen off the table and you can't get it done, or you consider a different structure to make things happen. So policy, I guess, ultimately, policy changes need to happen. And if you want to put in solar, just know that you really need to look over what the rate structure is because your return on investment, if you have Duke at least right now, is pretty good. If you have anybody else, it's not great. And a solar installer, they have programs so they can input what your return on investment will be. Uh, I, don't, I tend not to look. That will project things out 20 and 30 years. I typically don't look at that because if you knew what the future held, you wouldn't be here. You'd have your own island in terms of utility prices. So it's just best to kind of look at what's going to happen over eight to 10 years. And, and they, they can break that down. They have programs to do it. They just input it. And yeah, so that's kind of that's where we're at. I guess I'll wrap and take questions from folks. Yes, ma'am. You said um, on electric vehicles that the town of Waynesville is going to have to make a decision about what's going to happen. Like 26% of what's causing the problem for the climate. If we went to electric vehicles, what you just said about Biden having to go to the Middle East to get, yeah. get more oil, and certainly if there was an opportunity, I'm sure they would increase coal and oil production in this country for whatever we needed. If that electric vehicle takes off like you say it is, mm. isn't, it, isn't it going to encourage more of the coal production? And if it does, how does that compare to the 26%? Why would you go through all that trouble of yeah. getting all electric vehicles when you're just needing more coal to provide the electricity? Okay, so well, so the, here's the thing about the energy mix. So the energy mix, you, you see uh, Duke's plan, 12% down to 8% for coal. They're going to retire those plants. There is, there is, there's no worse business to be in, you know, if you're thinking ski slopes or newspapers, the worst business to be in is coal because it just takes too much money. Coal has to be subsidized in order to be cost effective. In fact, for the first time, uh, solar and, and re, 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 excuse me, re, renewables were cheaper than nuclear. Um, for like one month period here in the last two months, right? And, and, and nuclear is a very cheap form of energy. So coal is expensive. So if there is, there will be new increased energy demand, right? But it's not going to be met by coal. It'll be met by 
probably some natural gas plants, definitely some natural gas plants. It'll be met by nuclear and hopefully by increased renewables. But the thing about it is too, in terms of cost, the renewables ha are winning the day. They're winning the day because if you look at deployment, it's just on this hockey stick kind of trajectory and that's in the United States. If you look at Europe, it's much bigger than that and China, it's much bigger too. Uh, even though China will still rely on coal for a while. Every country has its own energy mix. But as we get away from the oil, the gasoline, we're not going to, you know, I've seen signs, somebody will scribble on an EV charger, powered by coal. And I'm like, I don't know, it might be true for that particular instant in time. But it, it's not a thing going forward, right? The energy of tomorrow will be cleaner. Yeah, does that answer your question? Mary, is it Mary? You got one, Mary? Or just, yeah. MJ. Could you address what's going on with community solar in Asheville? I know that they have a community solar program with subsidies for middle and low income people. So that they can participate in that and it's worth lowering the utility bills to 10 to 15 percent. Yeah. So unfortunately, I don't know the specifics of this, the particular solar energy program in Asheville. I do know that there, there are lots of different, there's a lot of ways, you know, to do this. And I've read some case studies and, you know, it's always a design, right? Because the utility is still going to own, most of the time, the community solar and someone's just going to buy into it. And... Or they buy into it or they lease it. There's a lot of different ways to do it. But ultimately, yes, you're right. What community solar can do is it can lower the price for people who subscribe to it or maybe purchase into it. Because, you know, after, especially at a utility scale. Because at utility scale, it doesn't cost $2 a watt to install. It's like almost nothing. They have, you can watch time-lapse videos and they're just putting in posts and the guys are coming right behind. It's creepy how fast it is and it's not, you know, sped up. So, yeah, um, Community solar has options. The one challenge for community solar in this area, unfortunately, is limited real estate, right? Because we just have, we have mountains all around. And the a land that is down here, if it's not in a floodplain, is desirable for building out buildings, housing, you know? So we're kind of limited, much in the way when I was from Wilmington that we're limited. There's the Cape Fear River and there's the Atlantic Ocean. So that's gonna be hard to just create a, a plot of land and put in solar. Typically, you know, if you go to Rockingham, North Carolina, you know, where the Speedway is, and sometimes there's concerts out there. It's just seas of solar. And I wouldn't say the land's useless. I'm just saying, like, no one, no one really lives there, so it's a good spot for solar. Um, so that, that, that is a challenge in this area. I would argue what might be an interesting maybe opportunity, and I'm just throwing this out there, but take something like the Folkmoot building. It's got a brand new roof on it. It runs all the way down. And I walk by that thing with the dogs and I think I'd slather the whole thing with solar panels. And then I would sell that energy to the people that live right around there in Hazelwood. And then they could get energy for less. More importantly, what community solar and solar in general can do is to help insulate communities from the exigencies of energy markets. Just like driving an EV helps protect you from the saber rattling that goes on in the Middle East and the stuff with Russia. Right? Gas, five, six dollars. No, if you're driving electricity, you're just driving. Solar can help offset that too whenever there are, you know, problems. And a lot of those problems are going to come from monopolies, right? Dukes might may be interested in buying Santee Cooper. We live in a, an environment where there are more mergers and less new companies, right? So there's less competition. And when you have less competition, price goes up. So that would be a way to help insulate. Steve? I guess uh, sometime in the future, I'd love to have a discussion about mass transit. And the electrification of rail lines, monorails, and so forth. I'm not sure how far they're going to expand in Europe with that. But building more roads, concrete, asphalt, or, as you know, as well as anyone, are not great, you know, energy uses. They emit huge amounts of carbon. Manufactured concrete, all the graphene is new technology. But mass transit, you know, to relieve some of the congestion and distress community in this country. And the electrification of mass transit could be a huge plus. I know like in DC, they're building metro out to the airport finally to mm -hmm. Dallas, Dallas and beyond that. But uh, we need to do more with that, I think. But that may be a whole other discussion. Yeah, and next time when we talk about, again, next time, August 13th, when we talk about electric vehicles, we're not limiting that to cars. There's something called EVTOLs, or electric vertical takeoff and landing, which are like air taxis. 
They're pretty incredible, and they're flying around somewhere right now in Burlington, Vermont. I flew in there, and I was looked up, and there's the guys out. Now, they're, granted, they're, they're primitive, but they're coming, and the Chinese are really trying it because all of their cities mostly are megapolises, and they can't have people getting around. You know, they, they thought about this, right, bicycles to... You know, they started out and they're walking, then they're on bicycles, then they're on scooters. And they had a plan back to the 90s that they were going to electrify a lot of things. And they're including, you know, air taxis. So that'll be part of the discussion next time, too. It represents a real interesting opportunity. You know, Peter Thiel, like him or not, billionaire, um, you know, he said, he quipped one time. He said, you know, we thought the 21st century would give us flying cars and we got, the, we got Twitter instead. You know, and it's kind of felt that way, the social media, all the turmoil, everything in the last 20 years. But here we are, we really are starting to see some really significant improvements in, in, in life and in air quality and transportation. And it's just a super exciting time to be alive. Questions? Any questions online? Okay. Yes, sir. Based on press reports I read, you and others had negotiated some kind of agreement with Waynesville to at least reimburse people for their solar production at like 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Not necessarily in that period. Right. Yeah, so it, it's, yeah, it's, 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 not, it's not net metering, right? Because net metering by, is by definition one for one. But it's, call it net metering minus 10%. So, it's it's like net metering minus 10%. And there's a, an initial bill. You know, you have your base fee to be hooked up. The challenge really, you know, as discussions continue, is what one, one, one of the sticking points was transformers, right? The system size can't be more than 10 kW. Well, that's not what Duke does. Duke allows you to have a 20 kW system installed. So we changed that. There's a question of who would pay for the transformers. Initially, the town said that the customer is going to have to pay for the transformers. And I thought that was ridiculous. I could not imagine a system in which the grid didn't take care of itself, that my responsibility stopped at the masthead, and then that became the grid. And the grid has to accept responsibilities for improvements. Um, but, you know, there's questions about, well, you know, and they were kind of, you know, whatever. Questions like, well, if you have solar and it produces too much, it's going to send it to the transformer and it's going to blow up. And I was like, no, that's not the case. But more importantly, I'm connected to my neighbor's transformer. You know, like we have like three neighbors connected to a transformer. So if my neighbors got a hot tub and a, a shop going, and then I don't know, had some other high load that day, and then they blew the tra how would you tease it out? You don't have the granular data to know who blew the transformer. What happens in town is if a transformer blows, if it catches fire, they just replace it. They don't come knocking on doors looking for who's responsible. So that's been changed. The town will pay for transformers. Uh, and the other stuff is like, how big can the system be? Will you allow for, 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 for a net zero household? And right now, um, you know, the discussion continues. But right now, the answer is no. It will not allow a house to be net zero. Because what I queried was, what if you want to future-proof your home, right? Because it costs to add on more solar panels at a later date. Not only that, you would have to get a different, transfer, uh, a different inverter, which costs money. So if you wanted to take advantage of tax credits, and install a system now, understanding that you would have an EV in a year and that you were going to change your heat pump in, say, five years from propane heat pump to propane air handler, that you could size the system to account for that. And in the meantime, you would just send electrons to the grid for free, and that was shot down. So it, it, it just, you know, it, I guess it continues, you know. Um, here's the thing. Ultimately, what the town is concerned about you know, guard, very guardedly is losing any of that income, that $1.3 million a year. And the thing that, you know, here's, here's a crazy notion, but what if you could just make that revenue stream of $1.3 million a year not so important? What if you could access U USDA loans as 0% interest loans? What if you could improve people's homes? What if you could help them put solar on houses? What if when they did that, they signed an agreement that, okay, based on a third party's rendering of what you're going to save, Let's say you're going to save $1,000 a year. Well, what if then, in order to account for the $1.3 million, what if we increase your ad valorem taxes $500 a year? The net savings is $500, right? I think people might be interested in that. That's just something to kick around because, you know, the number one rule of economics is there's no free lunch. 
So I think people understand that if you get this, it improves the value of your home, improves the comfort of your house, you're able to do the things you want to do, and yes, you pay more in property taxes, but you don't have to pay as much in energy, you know? Um, so that, that, that maybe is, that's just off the cuff, but that's a potential solution. Questions, we're over, we're 12 minutes over, any questions? All right, well, I'll stay after, and if anybody has any sort of granular questions for themselves, I'll be glad to take them, sure. And I just want to wrap up by saying, please come on the 13th. We hope it doesn't rain. You never know around here, but we're going to do, the talk on the 13th will be from 9 to 11 instead of 10 to 12, and we'll cover EVs. And it's important to come to that, not just the car show, because if you want to understand how they work, the plugs, the models that are coming out, all that stuff, it's super fun. It's like the Disney World part of this whole thing. And then I've got some really smart friends that are going to be here. Uh, my friend Dave Erb is an automotive engineer, and, you know, we're going to have Teslas outside. I'd like to get a Rivian if we could, but then some older vehicles too, because it's important to understand the mix of electric vehicles, and, and, and they're, they're going to be on site. So, um, and then, you know, I don't know, but I'm going to reach out to motion makers and see if we can get electric bicycles and other things, you know, that, that help with mobility. 